Hey, welcome to our online church service this morning. I'm so glad that you could make it um, and join us for our service. If it's your first time, I want to be the first person to welcome you to Farside Church Belfast. And I want to let you know um, that God is for you and he's with you. Um, we have one agenda and that's just basically to introduce you to Jesus. We have an amazing Pentecost Sunday service lined up for you um, and I'm, I cannot wait just to share in the service with you. We have some communion um, that we really believe that God's going to speak to you. Pastor Samuel and Zelda are going to greet you in a, in a moment and we've got an amazing inspirational message that you can listen to and just be um, encouraged and uplifted in your faith. Um, so I'm just going to pray for you before we begin um, that God's going to be with us He's going to speak to us um, in our homes and in with our family. So Jesus, I just thank you that you're here with us. Um, you go with us wherever we are. I thank you for what you're doing at this time. I think, thank you that you're reshifting the church just to um, be in line with what you're doing, God. And um, I just pray for wisdom at this time. I pray for household salvation at this time. Um, we pray for the prodigals, God, that they would come home um, and just be reintroduced to you, Jesus. And I just thank you for who you are. Um, I thank you for what you've done for us. And I thank you that you've allowed us to be free um, and given us joy and peace, God. And um, I just pray this service will bless us. We, you will speak through um, our preacher this morning, God, and um, I just pray every one of our church congregation will be blessed where they are. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, uh, Forestside Church family and friends. You're very welcome this morning um, to our broadcast. This is a special uh, service today because this is uh, Pentecost Sunday and we just know God has something awesome in store for you as we just go through your service today. Thank Amen. you for spending time with us. Thank you for allowing us to pray for you. Thank you for being part of the last eight, nine weeks. Yeah. We have enjoyed the journey with you, but we're feeling now the sense that we're going to be gathering soon. Yeah. In the next few weeks, it's a bit like um, Noah in the ark and he's sending out that those birds just to test the waters. Yes. Um, but there will be a time when we will um, come out of this and we will worship again, we worship together again, but allow God to finish the work that he has started um, with, with us all um, separated in our own homes because he has taught us many things, yeah. I think, you know. I think if you're, uh, if you're new to our online broadcast or uh, you've been a person that maybe for whatever reason that you love Jesus but you haven't, uh, for whatever reason just been at his house for a long time and you've been tuning in maybe not only to this broadcast and maybe some of you have been tuning in to lots of broadcasts and I think, I think the Holy Spirit is wanting to uh, rebuild again um, a connection to his house yeah. and to his people um, and we had been chatting uh, this morning about uh, and this afternoon just about our, our whole DNA, what does is, what is the Lord have for us? And you know, the first church were not only in the temple or in the synagogue or in the church, but they also met in homes. And, and, and the book of Acts says an amazing thing. It says, and they devoted themselves. Uh, isn't that a powerful and word? They, beautiful. they devoted themselves uh, to one another and to the Lord. And, and I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, particularly if you are, you've been alone or been disconnected to um, the church body for some time, you know, it, it would be God's heart that you would be in his house and it would be God's house that you would be would be connected. Psalm 68 says that he takes the individual and he puts them in families and there, there, is, a, there is a purpose uh, for you um, to be with people and to be in a place where purpose can be can be found again. So I, I, I think God's going to um, do something amazing as we come out of this because we do sense, we do sense that, that we're going to gather again. We're already starting to prepare our hearts for um, our gatherings within our, our church uh, building, but, but increasingly more than that, the Lord is really speaking to us about not only our gathering, but, but how we, how the kingdom is carried in our homes yes. and in our communities and how we devote uh, um, to each other in the purposes of the Lord. Listen, enjoy the service this morning. Uh, be blessed. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday we remember what the Holy Spirit uh, does in our hearts. We know you're going to be blessed. 
Open your hearts this morning. Be blessed in your homes. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless.
So 
to uh, communion time this morning and uh, it is the most powerful uh, place for us as believers and the first church it says that they, they broke bread from house to house and we've been saying this over these last nine or ten weeks we're saying that the breaking of bread is not confined to a Sunday morning or a special after service um, if you're a believer we want to encourage you to break bread daily if you yes. can um, and remember this covenant communion um, which the Lord has brought you into simply by believing in the finished work of Calvary. Um, this is powerful today because not only do we remember the blood that was shed, the Passover, um, but after Passover or after the cross um, came Pentecost. And the, the promise of the Passover was that Jesus, would, Jesus' blood would cleanse us from our sin. And then he would do something really quite remarkable. He, he, he would fill us. He would give us the promise. Actually, the Bible says it's the promise of the Father. Yes. That he would fill you with the Holy Spirit. Um, and the Holy Spirit always comes where the blood has been shed. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to encourage you today. I, I hear people saying, you know, I'd love to be a Christian, but I, I couldn't be a Christian because I couldn't keep this life. The, the truth about it is God doesn't ask you to keep it. And it would be very foolish of you to even try to keep it. That's not what God asked you to do. The truth about it is that God um, has promised because of the blood that was shed, because of the cross, he promised to give you his own Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said in John 7, out of your belly or yes. out of your heart is going to flow rivers of living water. He is going to give you the same Holy Spirit of which the book of Romans says that the Holy Spirit, the, the love of God has been shed upon your hearts yeah. by the Holy Ghost. And what the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit begins to speak of you of your righteousness in the yes. covenant and the power that was in the cross. So I, I just want to say to you this one, we're going to pray uh, in a moment. We're going, to, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit. But he has come not to speak of himself, but to speak of the things of God, to think, yes. speak of the things of Christ, to, to speak to you of the finished work. You know, he comes uh, to convict you that you are righteous. He comes to convict you that you are sanctified uh, through the blood. He comes to convict you that the word can bring about in your life a transformation of healing and of, of an empowerment to walk. So um, when he says you shall receive power after that, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. I know, I know that it is so that we can witness, but we are witnessing to the fact yes. that Jesus has brought us into a new covenant, finished work, paid for by his blood, and he promises to be all to you that he was to Jesus Christ himself. You can be full of the power of God this morning. You can be full of the Spirit of God. And I just want to encourage you in that this morning. I want to encourage you to know that this life is lived in the life of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to come around the, the table this morning. And we're going to thank the Lord for his body that was broken. We're going to thank the Lord for his blood that was shed. And we just want to pray for a moment, uh, just this morning, that you would have a renewed encounter of the Holy Spirit. We cannot live this life without the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. And uh, he is powerful. He is beautiful. He is the advocate. Um, and he is the wonderful counselor this morning. So let's just let's just have some communion time. Zella's going to pray um, over the bread this morning. Amen. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Oh, I just want to worship In you, the Lord. Name of Jesus. I need to hear these life-giving words <inaudible> that your spirit confirms to my heart and my spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that I take this bread, a symbol of your body, for nothing was acceptable other than Christ. And so I stand um, in Christ this morning, believing in the preciousness of um, his blood and for the power of um, his broken body to make me whole and to give me a life abundant. And so I receive from you now, um, 
Heavenly yes. Father, and I thank you, Lord, for this promise, Lord, of your spirit yes. that Hallelujah. brings alive these, these symbols, that you bring them alive to my heart and my mind, and you renew yes. me. Um, just, Lord, as the sun shines, the sun of righteousness arises, Lord, we, we look to you, Lord, and we find, Lord, our strength and our life in you. So we take this bread and we receive all that you have promised, Lord. If we don't understand it all, let your spirit, Lord, bring us a revelation day by day in a greater way. Lord, we just rely on you to speak of the goodness of God. So we receive it in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that when they put the crown of thorns upon your head, Lord, it was that you would cleanse us from an evil conscience, Lord, and you would give us a sound mind, Lord. Your head was crushed so my mind, Lord, can be whole before you, Lord. We thank you for your blood today. The word of God tells us that in whom we have redemption through, through his, his blood. blood. Lord, we, we, we honor the blood, Lord. We honor the power that is in the blood in whom we have redemption through his blood, Lord. We do not have a bloodless gospel. We thank God for the blood, Lord. We thank God for the humility that bows and said, I accept the way of the cross. And so, Lord, we just receive this morning. As we drink, we remember that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us Thank you, Lord. from every sin and every place of regret, every place of failure. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us. And so we just receive in thanksgiving this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. And we just welcome you, Holy Spirit just right now that you would renew in us fellowship, Lord, that you would renew in our hearts the love of God, that the love of God would be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would quicken those who are, uh, Lord, the Bible says that you quicken the dead, Lord, the dead in spirit, Lord, that there would be a quickening of the Holy Ghost, Lord, that there would be a filling again, even in your people, that because you encourage us, and then you test them to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, even in your heart unto the Lord. And I just pray there would be a quickening of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray where there is dead things that the Holy Spirit would just quicken, that the Holy Spirit would make alive, Lord, and that, Father, those that have been closed or places of our lives that have been bound up, Lord, let there be a flowing of the river of God. Let there be a flowing of the spirit of the living God. Even now, let it, let it just flow. Let it just rise up. Spirit of the Lord, rise up. Even right now, let there be an overflow. Let there be a flowing out, Lord. Lord, your spirit is not measured by what we contain, but by what is what flows out of our hearts, Lord. And I just pray for an encounter, an age of the Holy Spirit, even as we come back as a church, Lord. In a few weeks' time, Lord, when we come back to meet again as a church, I pray that this new era would be marked by an encounter. Lord, right across our city even, right across this nation, Lord, by an encounter of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. A deeper sense of the Spirit's work in the church, Lord. A deeper sense, a, a, a sense Lord, uh, Lord, of, of waters that your word tells us that we can swim in, Lord. Hallelujah that deeper sense of a saturation of the spirit of the living God, because it is the promise of the Father, Lord. And I just pray this morning for every heart to be revived by the spirit of the Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. And amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you this morning. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Would you, would you turn to John uh, chapter uh, 17? And also, while you're doing that this morning, will you just flick over to Luke uh, chapter 24? Um, because I, I want to read um, a verse from there as well. I, I believe with all of my heart, and just to say to you this morning, I'm, I want to preach to you this morning on the, the baptism of the Father's love. That's, that's my heart. I was so thrilled to hear the prayer from Pastor Sam this morning. And I, I want to just speak to you this morning on the baptism of, of the Father's love. I believe with, with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit is going to baptize 
the church with a fresh revelation of the Father's heart and the Father's love, a depth that you have never known before in all of your life. And I sense so much um, that the Holy Spirit is going to open and to flood our hearts and to emerge our churches with an overflowing, joyful understanding and filling with the Father's love. I believe He is doing it. He has been doing it and He's going to continue to do it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, great controversy in, in many places in the church, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts, which brought a confidence. This was, this was, this was the, the sea change for the early disciples and the apostles because if you look at them prior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they really in many ways were all over the place. They were in fear. They, in, in John 31, they were going back to their businesses. They, they were fearful of what Rome was going to do with them and what the Sanhedrin was going to do with them, what the synagogue was going to do with them. And suddenly there comes this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now the man who's denying Jesus Christ is standing up on the first day in Jerusalem preaching to 3,000 people the confidence and the message of the gospel which is the message of the new covenant and so the baptism of the Holy Spirit which brought in the book of Acts a confidence and empowerment to the first church and I'm, I'm going to say something quickly but I don't want you just to muse over it was essentially the love of God filling their hearts by the Holy Spirit Praise God. And this, this love of God, when understood and opened, will be the empowerment from fear and will be the empowerment to live a life free from the dominion of sin, will be the empowerment to live a victorious life. The baptism of the Father's love in the church will be the revival that touches the world again. And I know that as a huge statement. But I just want you to mark it in your mind, in your heart. It will be the revival that touches the world. Again, I have lots of scriptures today, but I want to take you to two in particular to help us understand how God wants to speak to us this morning. How many know God wants to speak to us today? Would you say a big amen this morning? For God, God, our God, is, is relentless in his love for the church and for humanity and for people. Our God this morning. In John chapter 17, if you have never taken time out to read it, if you have never taken time out to muse through John chapter 17, John chapter 17 is the most amazing chapter. And Jesus in John chapter 17 is speaking to the Father prior to the cross. Just prior to the cross. And Jesus, in his conversation with the Father, in his prayer with the Father, he concludes with the Father the terms by which the world would be saved and the world would be reached. That's what's going on in John 17. And John 17 is the most intimate prayer conversation between the Father and the Son anywhere in the New Testament. Totally intimate. It's, it's almost when you read it that you're, you're a bystander. It, it almost feels like you're intruding on what the Son is saying to the Father. And Jesus says to the Father, His Father, in John 17, and I'm going to paraphrase first of all. He says, Father, because I have fulfilled all that you have asked of me. And if you belong to this church, you'll know what that means. You'll know that it means in covenant. You know what it means that he had to walk in righteousness. He had to be divest of his glory. He made an agreement, and you'll read it in Isaiah 41, Isaiah 42, that I, I make an agreement with the Father, and I'm going to come and save humanity. And he, he, he does all of those things, and he, he says, Father, I fulfill all that you've asked of me. And then he says the most amazing thing. The most astonishing thing he says to his father father now i want you to give them what we have praise god i want you to give them what we have and and throughout uh john 17 in particular as you come to the end and from sort of 18 right through to 26 he, he begins to list the things that the father would give us and in verse 26, which is really where I, I want to be this morning and where I want to really speak to your hearts this morning. In verse 26, Jesus says, he says to the Father, Father, I have declared unto them thy name. 
and I will declare it. In other words, he said, I, I have declared, Father, what you are like. And then this is what he says. He says that the love wherein thou hast loved me, praise God, may be in them and I in them. Can you say praise God this morning? In Luke chapter 24, and we're just going to look at one verse. Luke 24 and 49 is now after the cross. John 17 is before the cross. So in John 17, Jesus has said to the Father, I want you to give them something. I want you to give them love. And I want you to give them the love that we have between us. And now in Luke 24, Jesus is standing with his disciples. It's, it's really his farewell address to his disciples after three and a half years. And it's now after the cross. And these are Jesus' final words. And, and I think this morning, church, that if it's Jesus' final words, we need to pay attention to what he's saying. Because I pay attention when people are leaving me or are parting or particularly if they're going away for a long time. Their last words are important, Jesus. Last words are important after the cross. Jesus is saying his fi final farewell to his disciples and he says to them, wait because the Father is going to give you something. Do you see how we're tying together this morning? Jesus said, oh, Father, I want you to give them something. Now after the cross, he says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem because the Father is going to give you what we talked about in John 17. Verse 49, Jesus says, and behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be in Jews. with power from on high. Praise God. Praise God. Have you, ever, have you ever went to a place or a venue and couldn't get in because you didn't have the right clothes or the right ID or the right credentials? If I'm thinking of a club, you shouldn't have been there. Or I'm thinking of something else this morning. All right. Or have you ever went to a place and when you arrived, someone said, I wasn't expecting you. I, I was expecting someone else. I was in a place a couple of years ago. And after a meeting with this person, actually it was a police officer. And after meeting this police officer, a friend at the time, who was also meeting, meeting that police officer, she said to me, the police officer wasn't expecting you. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the, the officer was surprised that you came, but I said, I, I was on the list. I, I had an appointment like, like you uh, on the list. I, I had a, an appointment to go to see the police officer. And she said, well, she was expecting the pastor of the church. I said, well, I am the pastor of the church. But she said, she said to my friend, she said, no, no, but he doesn't look like a pastor. I, I didn't expect when you said the pastor was coming, I didn't expect the minister to look like. And then I said to her, well, what does a pastor need to look like? Is there a pastor's manual to how pastors conduct themselves? And I have to tell you this morning, church, I was a little bit chuffed that I didn't look like a pastor. I just a little bit, actually I was relieved. <laughs> When Jesus came to the church, the synagogue, Israel, 2,000 years ago, they didn't expect him. They didn't expect God to look like or to act like or to be like Jesus. Whatever concept of God they had, Jesus didn't fit their typology. They had known from the prophets that God, the Holy One of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had promised to come and to be unto them a deliverer and all of the prophets and all of their history and all of their books taught and prepared them for the arrival of God in their midst. But when he came, he didn't look like, he didn't sound like, he didn't act like what they thought God should be. They were expecting someone else. They thought God should be different. They thought God should be different. 
and all of their churches or their synagogues were emerged in definitions of God training and schooling in the ways and the precepts and the ordinances and feast days and the remarkable history and their oral history. And it was a society emerged in the teachings of God. But when he came, he didn't look like the God they waited for. He was so different to what they expected. He didn't fit their understanding of what God should be. And when that happens, there arises a problem in the church. There arises a problem with church folk because the God of the church or that the church talks about and presents in boxes for the masses may not be the God that comes. It may be that we do not see God fully as He really is. There isn't multiple definitions of God. There is only one definition of God, you understand. There's only one definition of God and we find it in the Word of God. But our definition of God or our interpretation of God may need to be enlightened further by the Holy Ghost or may need to be a furtherance of revelation of who God is. Amen, church. They waited for someone to come, but someone different came. And one of the saddest things in the Word of God, and one of the things that you will read, even beyond Jesus saying, I came unto my own, and my own did not receive me. I came unto the church, and the church did not receive me. Even beyond that was the fact that they did not know or understand that it was Him that they longed for. It was Him. Jesus said of the church of his day in John 8 and 19, listen to me, you neither know me nor you know my Father. Wow. But I thought I knew him. I thought I thought I knew everything about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I thought I knew the Torah. I thought I knew our oral history. I attended my church every Sunday morning. I went to my synagogue. I knew my rabbi personally. And Jesus said, you never know me nor you know my Father. You don't know what I'm like. Because he said, if you'd have known me, watch it, you'd have known my father. Did you hear that this morning? The message says, you're looking right at me and you don't see me. When Jesus came, he came to manifest, he came to reveal who the father was. That's why in John 17, Jesus said, Father, I have declared your name. For three and a half years, I have declared your name, and I will declare it, and the people will know who you are, Father, through me. I am going to be the one who shows you what God is really like. Can you say amen to that this morning? Everywhere Jesus went, he demonstrated the Father's heart, the Father's nature, and the Father's loved, and He showed them continually what God was really like. Jesus' first sermon in Matthew, because first things are really defining things. And Jesus' first sermon in Matthew was a, a defining moment, a, a sea change in how the Father would be understand and understood it. It paralleled how God would, would reach us and deal with us in Jesus Christ. We call the sermon in Matthew the Beatitudes. I'm so sorry we call it the Beatitudes. Because I reckon to most church folk and certainly to the world, it makes no sense at all what the Beatitudes are. I'm so sorry we call it the Beatitudes. But that first sermon in Matthew, or we know it as the Beatitudes, was really a series of prophetic blessings upon the people. That's what it was. And Jesus is preaching on the mountain. I want you to see this. Jesus is on the mountain, and you've probably seen in the movies, you've seen hundreds and thousands of people around the mountain. Jesus is on top of the mountain. And Jesus is preaching His first sermon to the people. He's preaching to them what the Father's really like. Because they wanted to know what God was like. And they were listening. They wanted to know what would be the first sermon of God. What do you think the first sermon of God would be? If you hadn't heard or seen Him for hundreds of years. Jesus is on the mountain. This is a, a crucial moment. It's a powerful chance 
for him to define to them how what God is, what the Father is really like. And Jesus opens his mouth and he begins to bless them. I love that this morning. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. You see, in the Old Testament, they were terrified of him. They were terrified of his judgments and his plagues upon them because of their sin. And Jesus opens his mouth and says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And he blesses the people in his message, in his sermon. And he walks down the mountain with the Father's message in his mouth. And he touches and he heals a leper. Isn't that awesome this morning? Isn't that beautiful this morning? I hope this morning you're starting to see who God really is. And he blesses and then he begins to heal the people. And he was opening up the Father's heart and the Father's love to the world. I have come to declare your name, Father, and I will declare it. Such a contrast to another sermon. In a mountain called Sinai, where the sermon came as a series of commandments, as a series of laws, where the, where the very mountain shook, and, and, and God said, if anyone touches the mountain, you'll be killed because of my holiness. And because of my awesomeness, and there was no way to get to God in the Old Testament but by perfection and by the law. And do you know what it said when God thundered his sermon on the mountain? It says the people stood afar off. And Moses said, I exceedingly quick, and I fear at the sight that I've saw. Because he was fearful of him who was glorious in holiness and awesome in perfection. And God used that law through Moses to bring a death in them. That they might look away from themselves and they would look to him except only by grace and love. And they would look only to his son Jesus Christ. For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And God used the law to bring a death in them. And the law lay as a burden and as a weight for 400 years against them until the Father would burst upon their society and their culture in the form of Jesus Christ. And when He came, He came with a baptism and overflowing and a fullness of the Father's heart. And the law couldn't get them to God, but God got to them in Jesus Christ. And the Father could couldn't wait to get to this world. Praise God. You see, the Old Testament was not a series of, pre of, of preventative measures from getting you to God. God in the garden in Genesis was desperate at every point, at every covering, at every lamb that was slain, at the veil in the temple, at the commandments given in Sinai. Everything that God did was to prepare a way for Jesus Christ to come. God has been desperate from the beginning of time to burst upon humanity with His love. With His love. He says in Jeremiah 31, He says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love that precedes Eden. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. With loving kindness I have drawn thee. The rival of God in Jerusalem became a baptism and overflowing of the Father's love and the Father's heart to people and to humanity. Everywhere Jesus went, He healed them, He freed them, He sat with them, He opened His heart to them, He displayed and manifested the Father's love in the towns of Nazareth and, and, in, and in Galilee and the totality of His ministry and of His of arrival was to display the love of God. And the Father's heart, I have come in my Father's name, and I am declaring to you who my Father is. Praise God. And we see Jesus everywhere, and in every encounter, and in every action displaying and showing us what the Father is really like. Jesus, every move, every word, every action 
was to show us the reality and the nature who the Father was. And in John 5 and 19, Jesus says, The Son does nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father do. That means that every action for three and a half years, every time you read the Word of God, every action, everything that you see Jesus doing, you see Jesus doing with the heart of the Father. Do you see that this morning, church? And the Father's love and the Father's heart is displayed and touches the world in Jesus Christ. Now I want, because I don't want you to separate this morning, but the Father is like this over here, but Jesus is like this over here. No, he doesn't say that. He says, Jesus says, I have come to do everything. As the Son, I've come to do everything that I see my Father. So I want you to see the Father in the Son this morning. I want you to see God in Christ this morning, how He how He operates and how He reconciles the world. And we see the Father in Christ in the temple. It always amazes me how church folk treat sinners. Absolutely always amazes me. And we see the Father in Christ in the temple. Jesus in the temple displaying the Father's love. What is the Father doing in the temple? He's shielding a woman who they want to stone. Because the woman was caught in the very act of, of adultery. The Bible says she's caught in the very act of in adultery. And the crowd that were going to stone her were probably doing the same. And if they hadn't done the same, they had thought the same at some point in their life. That's why the Bible tells us that the older men left first. Because when you have a little experience in life and you've lived a long time, you realize the fragility of your own heart of your own mind but I see the father with a woman who already was lying in shame what does the father do he shields her from the hypocrites that's what he does we see the father's heart as Jesus sits with a fraudster and an extortionist named Nicodemus and he enjoys a meal with his crooked friends. This is the father that you worship. This is who he's sitting with. He's sitting with a fraudster. And he's sitting with, with, with his, his crooked friends. Men that took bribes. Men that looked at the poor and didn't think about taking money off them for their own end. The father's heart leads Jesus to sit at a well. I, I love in the hustle and bustle of ministry when they're all coming to Jerusalem and they all want to go to the convention and they all want to go to the next crusade and we're all so frantic about ministry and, and calling and not building his kingdom but building our kingdom. We're all so frantic about what we need to learn. And Jesus said, you just keep going on to the conference. I have an appointment at a well with a woman. Oh, Hallelujah. And that woman, I don't want you to think, well, that's a parable. And Pastor Samuel, no, that could be you or me coming to the well. Because this woman is in the city and this, this woman has been sleeping with everybody in the city. And because she sleeps with everybody in the city, nobody wants to draw water with her. So she goes out at a time when no one's there. And Jesus said, I know when she's coming. The father knew she was going to be at the well. And the father said, I'm, I'm coming to the well because I'm going to talk to her heart. And out of her heart, the town's going to be saved and the city's going to be saved. And Philip in the book of Acts is going to have a revival because I spoke to that woman at the well. Are you starting to see what the father's like? And he sits with the woman and he knows all about her. And he lets her talk about everything. It's amazing that, that it's sinful people, people who are in sin, people who are on sea, if we'll talk about spiritual things before they talk about their hearts. Have you, you ever noticed that? You begin to talk. I, she says, well, we, we, our fathers worshipped. In Isn't that amazing? He, he worshipped we in this mountain and our father, Abraham. Did, and she begins to talk and Jesus just listens to her. And then he, and he begins to in tenderness. And he accepts her, you see. And he, he begins in tenderness and love to open her heart. And that's her father this morning. 
And our Father goes out of his way to cross the sea to free a man that's full of darkness, tormented by evil. He was a cutter. He, he cut himself, the Bible says. And the Father is touching Jesus, makes him whole and well. Everywhere he went, Jesus said, I do what I see my Father do. And he baptized the world with love, with love. And he pulled down and he pushed through their screwy ideas of his house and their screwy ideas of the Lord's day, the Sabbath. And he rebuked the religious people for criticizing, for healing on the Sabbath and never on a Sunday crowd. But Jesus said, I do my best work on the Sabbath. I am the Lord of my Sabbath. My best moves, my best healings are on the Sabbath day. Praise God. And he runs. And look, I know it's a parable, but he runs. And look for a lost son, a prodigal, a sinner, someone who had blown it. And he embraces him with unconditional love. Aren't you glad the father got to the prodigal before the elder brother? But the elder brother got to him first. He had never been in church. But the father got to him first. And Jesus declares and he shows us the true nature of the Father and he touches his world with an overflowing manifestation of love and God comes to demonstrate his love his love and the theme in Jerusalem was not that they love God but that God loved them and the theme in the church is not that we love God but that God loves us the Bible says that God so loved the world and that's, we say God so loved the world. Well, I knew that. I see that in the back of buses. I've heard people preach it, but you don't understand. He so loved the world's systems and their darkness and everything that came with it and their debauchery. And he said, I so love the world. And the people were beginning to understand the more they heard of it, the more they seen him, that it is God's love to them. It's not their love to God. 1 John 4 says, this is love. Not that, that we love God, but that God loves us. And we say, well, I love Him. Yeah, but we love Him because He first loved us. God is fixated. He is obsessed. He is overflowing in His object and, and His pursuit of love for you this morning. He moves mountains, he opens rivers, he opens heavens to display his love. He grows a tree that becomes a cross and he places himself on a cross out of his object, relentless, indomitable love for you and me. Praise God. And the theme of the Bible and the Father's heart in Christ is simply this church, he loves me. loves me how great is the love that the father has lavished bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God Paul the apostle I love Paul I, I looked at I looked at something yesterday and they were showing Paul as a man about six foot three with a, a glow around his head Paul was about five foot two and he he was bent over and he had a poor eye said I love Paul you know what Paul said Paul says in Galatians he says he he loves me me and he gave himself for me the gospel writer John John the gospel writer, John, the beloved, after being with Jesus. Do you know how John describes himself? John said, I am the disciple who Jesus loves. Who Jesus loves. When Lazarus was sick and Jesus came and, and everybody was there and all of the commotion, his sisters did not appeal to Jesus' power to heal him. But they appealed to Jesus' love to heal him for they said in John 11 and 3 they said Lord behold him whom thy are you getting this this morning him whom thy lovest 
It's His love to me. It's His love to us. It's God's love that is relentless. It's God's love is overflowing. It doesn't stop when you feel. It doesn't go away in your sin. It doesn't move aside in your doubts. It doesn't lift when you curse or run or you blame God. God stays focused, relentless, all-embracing, pouring out unmeasurable quantities of your love to you. And He says to you, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And Jesus displays completely what the Father is really like. And in John 17, Jesus said, I I have declared who you are, Father. And I will declare. And he touches and he changes the world of his day with the revelation of the love in the heart of the Father. You see, it is not a revelation of my love to God. Because my love to God can waver. But it's a revelation of God's love to us. And God's love to us that will change every heart, that will change every center, will change every church, will change every stumbling saint. When we get a revelation in the church, continual, deep, deep, deep revelation, continually, that God loves us, then the church will change and our societies will change and the way we do life will change. And He wishes today, God wishes today to draw us into a baptism of His love. Jesus didn't say something remarkable in John 17. He said, Father, that the love that we have I want you to give to them. I want you to give to the church. I want you to give to my people. Notice it's not us trying to achieve this. It's God going to give us something. It's it's God word to us, not us word to God. We have tried to force the church to love each other. I could tell you a confession. I could do it for a while. But eventually you'll test me. And eventually I'll say to the Lord, Lord, I don't really love them today. Because they've hurt me or they've hurt my kids. Or they've hurt my wife or they've spoke about me. And then I have to go back and I say, Father, would you give me love? But I don't have and I have to go back. Because my love, and I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to be honest with you this morning, my love is finite. And I have to come back all the time to get it filled up. And sometimes I have to walk in silence because, and you have to walk in silence because you know people have wronged you and done things. And we we get all hung up and all that sort of stuff. And then we try to force each other. You just need to love each other. Really? I choose my friends, but I don't want to choose the people I go to church with. (laughs) Am I making sense to you this morning? That's what we do, don't we? Choose our friends, but we don't. But go to, if I go to that church, I have to. He was good the first six weeks, but <laughs> do I really have to? You know? And our love, love is really finite. You see? And when we try to force each other to love, it doesn't really work. Because our love is really multifaceted. You know, we, we, we have love where we'll have our own we group, social group, or we'll have lodge that extends to our church. Our church is amazing. And sometimes we don't have love for the next church because uh, they're either doing better than us, or we have all of those screwy ideas of a church and people, and we compare. And we try to force the church to love each other and the world out of our own resources instead of a continual revelation of the Father's love. Because that's the only thing that changes. Now, I haven't time to go a lot further this morning, but I want to just say this to you this morning. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was a baptism of love in the book of Acts. That the love of God has been shed abroad. How was the love of God shed in the heart? It was by the, it was by the Holy Ghost. 
what did the Holy Ghost come to do at Pentecost? He came to fill what Jesus was in them. Jesus said, I'll put the Father's love in you, and it'll be I in you, and I in them. And I, I want to tell you this morning that the Holy Spirit is wishing to pour out and to fill our hearts with a deep work and a baptism of the Father's work in this house. God is going to overflow this house with the message of the Father's love. Jesus says to the Father, the love that we have, I want you to give them. And the promise of the Father is that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that we get a deep revelation of this love from John 17. We have talked and preached much about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, particularly in Pentecostal denominations. In fact, I, I have been in church. I'm just going to be really honest with you. This morning. I have five minutes and I'm close, but I won't be really honest. I've been in church and I, I've, heard, I've heard the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've heard somebody behind me says a lot of nonsense. You should have known better. Yet the first church waited. Jesus said, wait for what's coming. High on loving is those comments. We have talked and preached much about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, particularly in County Council of Mitchell. And, and we say this here, what give the first church their power? Because prior to the Holy Spirit coming, they were all over the place. So what changed? What did the Bible mean when it said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you? We get really excited and we raise our voices. You all receive power. That's compulsory to have power. And we preached, we have preached well the initial evidence. And we have enjoyed the spectacular manifestations because, because we sit in a Pentecostal church other here and we talk about tongues or spiritual language or we sit in the charismatic side over here and we, we say out the movings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does this and it's amazing. And both of those things are amazing, by the way. I'm not belittling. They are amazing and I embrace them with all of my heart. But when Jesus said, give them the love that we have, and then in Luke 7, Luke 24, he says, I'm going to give you the promise of the Father. I'm tying it together for you this morning. It was an overflowing, full immersion and baptism of the Father's love, the Holy Ghost coming into the hearts and shedding abroad the love of God in a deep demonstration on the day of Acts and on the day of Pentecost. That was the power that came. The power and confidence of the first church flowed exclusively out of love. Exclusively out of love. And all of the early fathers believed that. Can I give you a quote from the early fathers? The early fathers said that spirit baptism was a baptism in the divine love. Frank Machai, I think that's how we pronounce his name, wrote a book on the history of the Pentecostal movement. And this is what he said. He said, the spirit who mediated the love between the Father and the Son is now poured out so as to draw humanity into the canonia or into the fellowship of God and to gift and empower the church on the salvation. In 1833, in Bishopgate Street Meeting House, there was a mighty move of God. And Gunny, or Gunny, spoke in those meetings of the empowering nature of a baptism of love. In Azusa Street Revival, how many have heard of the Azusa Street Revival in 1904 in California? In the Azusa Street Revival in 1904, which most people credit to be the global move of the Holy Spirit in the last century. In the Azusa Street Revival in 1904, Frank Bantelman said, hey, listen what they said about this revival. The Spirit manifested most clearly in this revival through love. Divine love was wonderfully manifest 
in these meetings. A Lutheran pastor on commenting on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in his con congregation said, a spirit of pure love invaded the church and drenched me like rain. He, he was beating in my heart. He was flowing in my blood, breathing in my lungs, thinking in my brain. Every cell in my body, every nerve tingled with the fire of His presence and of His love. And the greatest result of the promise of the Father to pour out His Spirit was the baptism of love. Jesus said, by, by this shall you know that you're my disciples. You have love. But love doesn't begin with us. It begins with Him. The Father said, Jesus, give them Give the church, give every heart the love that we have between us. The question I want to just really say to you this morning. Do, do, we, do we want to build a church? Or do we want to live, build our lives on, on, on ministry and the mechanics of church? Or do we, do we want to build our lives, do we want to build our church on a baptism of love? Which is, which is the endowment of power for us to reach the world. I want to reach the world. I want to reach the world. But God didn't say bypass the baptism of love. God said, wait for the promise of the Father and I will give them what we have. And I feel in my heart, I feel in my heart and I know in my heart, no matter what I see, no matter what I don't see, I know in my heart this year we are coming into the depths of the Father's love. I know that with all my heart. And it is not my work to God, it is God's work to us. And I am saying to you this morning to open your heart, strip away the mechanics. If you do ministry, you will eventually burn out. But if you do, God, you will be baptized with a love that is endless that is overflowing and will touch the world. And the criteria this morning is very, is one simple thing, is that you open your heart and you abandon yourself. And actually, actually, and, and the truth about it is, maybe you need to strip aside all of the things that are making you busy, but not necessarily better for the kingdom and not necessarily understanding the Father's heart and His love. You can be busy without the love of God, do ministry. But you need a baptism of the Father's love and of the Father's heart. Thank you so much for joining our church service this morning. I'm so glad that you could be with us. Um, and I hope you've been encouraged and uplifted um, just listening to our broadcast. If you don't know Jesus, uh, we want to just give you the opportunity right now just to respond to him. Um, I just want to remind you that when you accept Jesus, your entire life's changed. Uh, we're just people with one agenda, and that's, the agenda is that we want to introduce you to a person, a real living God who wants a relationship with you. Uh, number one, Jesus has forgiven your sins. No matter who you are, your background, your nationality, what you've done, nothing you can do or can't do changes the way God views you, and He loves you, and He wants a relationship with you. Um, so much so that he died and he took away your sins at the cross. Number two, the love of God will change you forever. You'll never be the same when you accept Jesus. And we are just people who have personal testimonies of the grace of God upon our lives. And number three, if that's you, I want you just to say this prayer with me um, and just invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to completely change your life and live with you forever. So if that's you, we're just gonna pray right now. So just repeat after me, Jesus, I just am coming to you um, with all that I am and I just pray that you would take um, all of that desire that isn't of you away and you would forgive me of all my sins. I thank you that you have died for me and you rose again so that I could live and I just pray and invite you into my heart. Um, I thank you that you're here to stay, that you're here forever, God, and I thank you that you've changed my life forever. Um, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, that is the best decision of your life. Um, and I want to encourage you. We want to connect with you. We want to find you wherever you are in the world. We want to connect you to a local body, a local church. 
um, that will allow you to grow in your faith. So if you just go, the link's going to be below us. Um, it's go to farsidechurch.com forward slash Jesus. You'll find a little bit more. We've got resources available and there's a way to contact us. Um, we have opportunities also on our website. If you need prayer for anything or if you have a praise report, we would love to hear from you. Um, and the, the information is going to be below us. It, if you just go to farsidechurch.com forward slash prayer. You can also email our church at info at farsidechurch.com and one of our team will pick it up and respond to you as quick as possible. Um, I just want to remind you this week, church, we have our Zoom prayer meeting. Um, if you don't have the codes to that or you don't have access, we will want to give it to you and be joining our church online. It's very different, but um, it's really good to be able to see each other in person and just pray for anything that's going on in our church. And God answers prayer. He's answering our prayers all the time. Um, yes, uh, we've got one more thing. We have, a, uh, if you want to give to our church, if you want to help us financially, or if you just feel like God's given you something in your heart that you would like to bless us with, um, you can go to our website and there's a secure payment where you can go to farsightchurch.com forward slash give, or there's a text message service for anybody in the UK and that will come out of your um, allowance on your phone bill. But apart from that, uh, we thank you for your generosity. We thank our church for our, your generosity. Um, and we're really looking forward to meeting you in person um, after lockdown. But um, we pray you have a good week. We pray you be blessed this week. And we can't wait to see you on next week's broadcast. Amen. See you.